Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. On this episode, we begin to explore the latest influx of Italians to New York, much different from those we remember from Sepiatone photographs. Talking with the delightful pianist and composer Moira Lobianco about her journey from Calabria, Italy, to the prestigious Berklee School of Music, and a career in classical and jazz, correspondent Lucia Grillo takes us to the Lower East Side. We're joined at the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute by actor Eduardo Ballerini, who amongst the many Italian American and Italian roles he has played, recently added that of Carlo Tresca to the roster. In the film, No God, No Master. Step inside the St. Regis Hotel for a talk with the National Organization of Italian American Women's 2014 honoree, Lisa Lemuleaz, forging a bright, healthy future for couples and for the next generation. Immigration is a topic that divides not only our nation, but also Italy and a multitude of other countries around the world. As economic crises increase, and people are forced out of their homelands, they flock to more abundant countries. There, they face some of the hardships our ancestors did, some even worse, others only mildly inconvenienced. For the first of our series on new Italian Americans, Italics goes to the Lower East Side, where correspondent Lucia Grillo talks with up-and-comer Moira Lobianco. I'm Lucia Grillo with Italics. We're outside pianos in Manhattan's Lower East Side. We'll go inside for a talk with Moira Lobianco, pianist and composer. Moira, it's a pleasure to have you on Italics. Thank you so much for inviting me. Let's start with your beginnings in Calabria. Your love of music came about when you were a child, when your parents gave you a toy piano. Yeah, it was my fifth birthday. Uh -huh and I received this lovely toy piano that I still have actually in Calabria and uh, I never stopped playing it. And you've had quite a musical journey since then. I started playing classical. I found immediately my first love that was the keyboard music by Bach and Bartok. Mm -hmm. I studied at the conservatory doing my degree in classical performance. Mm -hmm. After that I started um, checking out other genres like jazz or songwritings, uh, I really did almost anything. I attended the University of Rome, where I studied literature and performing arts, focusing in ethnomusicology. After that, I went to do this audition in Nancy in France, and they gave me this scholarship, and I arrived here in the United States. You mentioned Bach and Bartok. So these were your early influences. Yeah, I grew up playing both of them. Uh, because one will counterbalance the other one. It's the counterpoint. So mm -hmm. many different lines that are independent, but at the same time they complete each other. And also very influenced by uh, folk music. That is also one of my uh, biggest love. What type of folk music do you like? I had the pleasure of collaborating with musicians that you know make me um, learn flamenco or Arabic music, mm -hmm. Sufi music, all the Middle East, but also of course um, the traditional music um, of Italy. I think it's very interesting too. When I was young, actually, I was part also of a folk group. Uh -huh. Thanks to them, I could um, sing and dance the traditional music of Calabria. And we were also touring because uh, we were doing these festivals around Europe. Mm -hmm. in, it was called Europeade. Mm -hmm. So we could also meet with other uh, folk groups from other places, so Spain, Greece. And what are your influences now? Are they the same? When I grew up, I started also being interested in jazz. Uh, so there are some composers that I really love, some pianists like Brad Meldau or Fred Hersch, Monk. We have your first album here, your debut album, Lunaria, and most of this album is comprised of several movements of a composition dedicated to Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, it's very funny because when I was growing up, I didn't like Marilyn at all mm -hmm. because she was so light and seductive. Uh -huh. So very distant from my image of uh, intellectual girl, right. you know. Right. But then when I start checking out her personal life, I could really understand that she was giving us an image that was completely different from her real life. So I apologized and I wrote 
uh, for her this sweet. And I'm trying to describe her as a human being, almost as a young child, because this is what was she was, you know, very fragile and delicate. Another piece on the album is called Signori. I grew up singing this uh, song, and uh, at some point I used four notes of the original version, and then I built around it an original composition, just to tribute Calabria. Do you consider yourself Italian-American? Not yet. I arrived three years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a new beginning for me, you know, it, it, it's very beautiful being here because I received so much love, Berkeley first and then outside Berkeley, in terms of music, in terms of friendships, mm -hmm. just in terms of uh, learning experience as a human being. Mm -hmm. My generation is full of people that, you know, want to do new stuff. It's different from the Italo-American, I think, that there was before. And do you find any similarities at all? Of course. I mean, we look the same. <laughs> <laughs> you both do like pizza. <laughs> yes, we are both loud. I think Italians are so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little bit biased. <laughs> You don't only record and perform, you also teach classical improvisation, yeah. which some people might think doesn't exist. I know, that's the problem. And uh, some people think that I am crazy too. <laughs> the composers that we love the most, they were all great improvisers. Uh, the problem is that they don't teach you that um, at the conservatory or in the music school where they teach only classical. Mm -hmm. So I create this uh, workshop series that is called Classical Chords. I would like that classical musicians can really understand how much important is improvising. Mm -hmm. Because we are not just machines. Mm -hmm. The great composers that we love, they were great improvisers. For example, um, Bach, mm -hmm. all the fugues that we know, most of them, they were improvised. When we say Paganini, uh, never repeat. It's because he will improvise all the time differently. That's why I am so passionate about um, bringing again uh, this practice of improvisation in classical music because now classical music, it's old, you know, the concept. So, of course, young people, they are not interested in something that is always the same. There is a lot of beauty that I think a young composer should take from classical music and bring in his own uh, story. This is what uh, I try to do. Your website says, the beauty of a chord change will save the world. As musicians, we have the opportunity to speak to a lot of people. We have the opportunity to be on stage. It's important to embrace a cause that is bigger then your ego is bigger than yourself. For example, I support the Enough Abuse campaign mm -hmm. uh, against the child sexual abuse. I think we should all do something, um, no matter what, but it's important, I think, for a musician to uh, embrace a cause that is bigger than your ego, is bigger than yourself. From Manhattan's Lower East Side, for Italics, I'm Lucia Grillo. As we combat stereotypes and acknowledge the existence of aspects of our culture that are merely unpleasant to us or actually detrimental, actors are amongst those who must face these challenges daily, questioning and either accepting or rejecting roles based on how they will portray their culture. Eduardo Ballerini is an accomplished actor and filmmaker who has navigated this path very well. 
Eduardo joins us at the Kleiner Institute to talk about his latest film, No God, No Master, now available on DVD and digital, in which he plays Carlo Tresca. Eduardo, welcome to Italics. We're here on the occasion of the release of your most recent film, No God, No Master, which was released in theaters last month in April and is now available on DVD and digital. Just to set it up for people a little bit, it's about the, the 1919 Wall Street bombings, uh, which is a real life event. And this eventually leads the country down a very paranoid path uh, where we get the, the Palmer raids, where a lot of immigrants were rounded up and thrown out of the country. We have a lot of the industrialists, the, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, who are using immigrant labor essentially as slaves. Mm -hmm. And there was a backlash against that, obviously. And at the forefront of that uh, were Emma Goldman and the character I play, Carlo Tresca, who was uh, an Italian immigrant who came here and was one of the founders of the uh, IWW. Uh, one of the largest labor unions in the country. It was an interesting character for me, you know, as an Italian, as an Italian-American, to play this guy who's so historically important but largely forgotten. Is there something beyond the interest of an actor that drew you to play Tresca? Sure. I mean, I am keenly interested in, uh, in labor and in unions. Uh, I'm a member of uh, two unions here in New York, uh, the actors' unions. Uh, and I have them to thank for many things, uh, my health insurance, my pension, all these kinds of things. And I'm keenly aware that without them, we would be working under very, very different conditions. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see where it all started. And the film also, it holds up today as well. When you were saying that the scene about being gunned down, I'm thinking like, you know, civil rights era and the brutality that was, sure. that was inflicted upon people then. And even more recently, INS roundups of Muslim men post 9-11. There's an absolute distinct parallel. You know, the Palmer raids, to me, and the, the Patriot Act are not that far apart. Mm -hmm. It just gives somebody enormous authority mm -hmm. to do whatever they want. And the target is, you know, the little guy. It's the poor guy. It's the immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the case of our film, there were a lot of Italians that were involved in that. Let's go back to you. You didn't have a typical Italian-American upbringing. No, my story is a little bit different. My father is Italian uh, from Milan, came here as a young man to study. I met my mother, who is American, and I had the good fortune to grow up back and forth. So I would do the school year here in New York, and then I would do summers in Milan. So I always find it interesting when I meet Italian-Americans, and obviously there's a shared connection. There's something between the, the two cultures, but I always feel like there's something a little different, like we come from slightly different worlds. Yeah, yeah. And there are things that I don't really understand about their world and there are things about my world that they don't understand. You've done a variety of Italian and Italian-American roles, mm -hmm. but you don't just throw in your generic Italian or Italian-American accent, like right. each role is very specific. Yeah, I've been fortunate in that, in that I, I certainly played a number of Italian roles. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, having my name and sometimes the language skills come into that. There was a character I, I did on The Sopranos where it was sort of perfect because it was this guy who spoke Italian and nobody quite understood where he was from, right? It's okay if I fix? He also spoke English, obviously, but it was like, car. who is this guy? Like, where is he from? <laughs> and I was like, that's the perfect role for me. And you played Signor Tommasi. George. The Consul General has requested the piece be placed in perfect view of his office. What was interesting about the character is that he was a very refined, sophisticated, intelligent Italian, uh, and, and a proper Italian from Italy. Mm -hmm. um, and there are not that many roles like that, let's just be perfectly blunt. Yeah. Uh, typically, the Italian or the Italian-American is the hoodlum, the mafioso, the thug. On his best day, the gigolo, I don't know, you know. <laughs> or the corrupt cop. Or the corrupt <laughs> cop or detective, <laughs> sure. But it is rare and it's something that you know, I wish were not the case, uh, that you get these roles for an Italian who's actually meant to be articulate and sophisticated and intelligent. Um, I think that will change. How do you see it changing? The stock character of the Italian is, is kind of receding. And by stock character, I don't mean to belittle uh, the actors or the writers, the directors who made these films and shows because they're wonderfully done. Mm -hmm. But the stock character of the mafioso um, has become, in fact, a stock character mm -hmm. that 
it will at some point turn into a caricature and then it will kind of lose what it is. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, and you can probably figure this out just talking to me, the ones that I find the most difficult are the kind of sort of gun-toting, you know, mafioso bully, which is so far from me. Your character in Boardwalk Empire was that, but you seemed still very elegant. I managed to find a guy who, uh, whose grandparents knew the family. They said that he was the more the sort of the, the Caruso of the, of the bunch. You know, he fancied himself a little, a little sharper. I mean, he was dumb as a post, but he fancied himself a little, a little, a little smoother. I'm Ignatius. I thought that was Lucian. Pop. He loves our mother very much. Let's talk about your own film, Goodnight Valentino, in which you play Valentino. It's a short film uh, that I made several years ago now about Rudolph Valentino, the silent movie star who, who died at age 31. Valentino came over as a 17-year-old, became the biggest cinema star in the world, and had enormous problems by virtue of being Italian. He was just lambasted from every corner. And because he brought an Italian style, and by that uh, I mean his dress and his mannerisms, people said he's gay, right? And you can imagine in 1922, 23, 24, and they accused him of the effeminization of the American man, of like bringing down the manliness of the United States. He got so upset about this that he, he challenged all these writers to duels and fist fights, which is probably the exact wrong reaction, right? And then he died, and the funeral was here in New York, and 100,000 people took to the streets and rioted to get a chance to see his corpse. And it's just this remarkable story about Hollywood, and about the Italian experience. Goodnight Valentino is in the Academy of Motion, or Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Yeah, it's archived Arch there. Yeah. Yeah. It was made back when you actually made film, and there's a print of it, which is down in the vault, uh, which is, is one of the prouder things of my life, I have to say. I want to bring up Dinner Rush, mm. which you were in the opposite classic. Danny Aiello. Yes. Uh, playing his determined son. Yes. But Great I'm film. not going to talk to you about that okay. because we have Anthony here who's a big fan of that movie and he would prefer to talk to you about Please. that. Please. <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of this movie too. I think it's a fantastic film. Yeah. yeah. I want to bring it back first to something you said about playing n Italian Americans in a non, in a different way, not mm. the stock character, et cetera, because in a way, the character you play, who is the son of a, a restaurant owner, mm -hmm. is a non-stock character. Absolutely. While he's very Italian-American, sure. he's doing something with food, yeah. which is entirely different. Yeah. The story is about an old world restaurant owner, Danny Aiello. He's more of a you know checkered uh, tablecloths exactly. kind of guy. Yes. And his son, Udo, who's a nouvelle cuisine chef. And there's definitely a generational and cultural split between the two. There are a number of metaphors that I've seen in the film. You know, the whole idea of mm -hmm. the sort of Italian creativity comes out in the way your character mm -hmm. deals with food and makes right. these dishes. They're, they're all Italian ingredients, sure. let's say, but they're, right. you know, th there's that one dish. Oh, when God, you're, the lobster tower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you have to impress the food critic, uh -huh. right? the very harsh food critic. Right, right. And, and yet it's all Italian stuff. Sure. So you see that and the visual juxtaposition with the food that the father wants sure. the Sausage and peppers, sausage and right, pepper. kind of thing. <laughs> Spaghetti, meatballs. But you're that. right. I yeah. mean, it is taking, you know, what you're, what you're given. So you're born into a culture, right? Yeah. So let's take this character. He's born into his father's culture. And he takes the elements and he makes something new out of it. And I think that's, you know, what we're seeing largely, is that it's still going to be tied to the culture. There's never going to be a clean break. Right. And there shouldn't be, quite frankly. You know, it is a fascinating uh, cultural question that, that we experience as Italians and Italian-Americans. Uh, Italy obviously has an enormous influence on the culture of this country. Uh, and as we said earlier, has at times been relegated to certain parts of it. Um, but there is certainly no denying the, the importance and the influence of it over the 20th century especially and into the 21st I mean, we talk about old world new world and it's still a question you know and it's a question that occurs to me when I get uh, interest in a role or I see a role that happens to be Italian or Italian American it's always part of the equation what is this role how am I representing the culture I think a lot of the 
ironclad stereotypes are kind of eroding. Tresca is really something that's going to open people's eyes. So the film is now available on DVD? It is now available, digital. yes. It is uh, in all the, the usual places, the iTunes, the Amazons, the Netflixes, all that. Great. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining Thank us. you. Thank you both. Really Thank you. Host of The Lisa Oz Show, best-selling author, and editor-at-large of Dr. Oz, The Good Life. Lisa Lemelay Oz was honored at the National Organization of Italian American Women's 2014 Gala earlier this month. Our own Lucia Grillo joins her at the St. Regis Hotel before the ceremony to talk health, relationships, and what it means to be an Italian American woman. Lisa, thank you for joining us on Italics. Thank you so much for having me. And congratulations on being honored this year by the National Organization of Italian American Women. Thank you so much. I am thrilled. You're also the keynote speaker this evening. What are some of the points that you might touch upon in your speech? My husband and I are always talking about wellness and the Mediterranean diet, as we all know, which Italy is a big part of, is the healthiest diet in the world. And just how much I have always been drawn to Italy. What does it mean in, in today's society to be an Italian American woman? Well, I think it means that you're really hot. <laughs> and the stereotype of Italian woman for me is the Sophia Loren, um, very sexy, very passionate. And you know, one thing the Italians are always is passionate. You never meet a dull Italian. And here I am with my hands, okay? Um, but I think, and a woman in today's culture also is a smart woman, but she's a woman who merges her emotions with her thoughts. You grew up in Philadelphia mm -hmm. with an Italian American father. Yes. What was that like? Amazing. The best part was that we had this big collective family. So my grandparents who were in Staten Island would come down on weekends and it would be all about food. Food has always been such a big part of our lives. Italian food primarily, but it's always about celebration and getting the family together. Um, interestingly, my mom's not Italian at all. My dad was a little more reserved and my mom thought she was Italian. She is the best Italian cook I know and she's also all hands, all passion, <laughs> Bigger than life, but I think she became Italian by exposure. Talking about your dad, besides having a unique place in history as being part of the surgical team that performed the first successful heart transplant in the U.S., he's somewhat unconventional. He is. He he has used alternative medicine for his most of his practice, at least while I was growing up. Um, he also was the first physician to play rock music in the OR and was, was featured in Rolling Stone magazine as the rock doc. He's a bit unconventional. Did he influence your consciousness about healthy oh, living? Oh, very much. Both of my parents actually have, were a great team. Um, my mom was the one who first made the foray into alternative medicine, but my dad, once, it had, once he understood the science behind it, if there was science behind it, and it, it made sense to him, he was embraced it wholeheartedly. So it definitely influenced me um, and my husband. I remember the first time my husband, now husband, came back to our house when we were dating. He thought he had landed on Mars. He didn't know what vegetarians were. He hadn't heard of homeopathy. The whole thing was crazy for him. But it's definitely been a huge influence in the way that we approach health. You're also very unconventional or pretty unconventional as far as Italian Americans are usually considered. You practice Reiki in your personal life and holistic. We like to think of it as integrative medicine because you want to use it in, in conjunction with modern medicine. Mm -hmm. But this is really the globalization of medicine because these are practices that have been used all over the world for centuries, if not millennia. Mm -hmm. So you have Ayurvedic medicine from, from India and you have acupuncture from China and you have great herbs that I'm sure they use in the hills of Sicily. Yeah. And tapping into that knowledge, that wisdom from you know our past, the, whatever tools we can use to heal is what we want to use and, and to give Mehmet's viewers or our readers. That's the goal, is to empower people to use what works mm -hmm. for them. There are people who are convinced that you can't be Italian and live without capocollo or soprasata. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would say I can and do, <laughs> and uh, there are so many wonderful vegetable dishes in the, the Italian menu um, that I don't even miss the meat. So uh, everything from the eggplants with the with the you know tomato and onions and olive oil to the zuc fried fried zucchini, not so healthy but delicious antipasti dishes. Mm -hmm. You could live off those. You never need to get to the was it the second piatti or something exactly. as the meat. No, forget it. <laughs> Stick with the first two courses. <laughs> Amongst the many hats that you wear, you talk about relationships. How do stereotypes come into play? Do 
you know, for example, does the does the stereotype of the shouting, impassioned, expressive Italian American is that real? And if so, does it shape our perceptions of relationships and influence our behavior? There's always a good and a bad side to any any kind any type of culture. Mm -hmm. um, where it becomes dangerous is when you fall into a, a unconsciousness. So your behavior isn't a chosen behavior. It's a routine. And when you make choices that are by habit and not because you are actively choosing that, then it can hurt a relationship because you're not engaging authentically with the other person. You're not maybe not actually hearing what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And that's where the shouting can be a problem too. When you get too ingrained in the, the shouting, um, then you don't focus on what's best for the couple. And speaking of great couples, together with your husband, you helped found Health Corps. We educate kids. Mm -hmm. So we put um, young college graduates, and they teach the kids three things primarily. The first is nutrition, how to eat well, how to read a food label, mm -hmm. things that they, they're never exposed to at home. Two, movement, because you know PE, when we grew up, there was PE in school. Right. There's no PE in most schools now, so they need to find new ways to move. So we give them pedometers, we create contests, we just incorporate movement back into their life. But the third part, and the most important, is that we teach them mental resilience, mm -hmm. so ways of coping with stress. Because most of these kids make bad health choices because it's a stress modifier. So whether it's poor eating or smoking or engaging in sexual relationships too early, all those things are ways that they cope with stress. So we give them tools like yoga, meditation, journaling, um, art therapy, just other ways so that they can deal with their life and don't turn to unhealthy solutions. Is it mainly in inner cities? We try to focus on at-risk communities. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be inner cities or it can be schools in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. It's wherever kids aren't exposed to the resources or the benefits that they should have. In neighborhoods where they really don't have access or the financial ability to afford healthy foods, what kind of recommendations can you make there? That's one of the things we teach kids too, is to, to become advocates for healthy communities. So they go home and talk to their moms about what to buy. They go into their local bodegas mm -hmm. and talk. That we've and taught them to talk to the to the store owners and say, if you stock up on fresh fruits and vegetables, we will buy them. I'll get my mom to buy them. They make it cool to eat, to know about healthy food, to eat healthy food. They talk between their peers and and encourage them not to take the cheeseburger. Um, so we do try to help them find the healthier choice. Most of these local communities have healthy foods as part of their culture. So beans, for example, mm -hmm. a great choice. Rice, you can choose the brown rice rather than the white rice. Mm -hmm. But beans and rice and vegetables are a really healthy choice that are much better than going for the processed, prepackaged hamburger or french fries. Fantastic. Thank you so much and congratulations again on your honor. Thank you. Also honored at the Noya event, receiving the Friend of Noya Award was CUNY, the City University of New York. Accepting on behalf of the university was Senior Vice Chancellor Jay Hershenson. Italic spoke with Mr. Hershenson, as well as his celebrated Dr. Oz, Mistress of Ceremonies Ornella Fado, Honorary Chair Donatella Arpaia, 2013 Gala Honoree, former First Lady Matilda Cuomo, and more. Watch the event in its entirety on our YouTube channel, Italics TV. Mark your calendars. In its second year, in Shena, Italian Theater Festival in New York, opens June 9th, at the iconic Arthur Avenue Market in the Bronx with special guest Yaya Forte, a leading actress in Paolo Sorrentino's Oscar winner, The Great Beauty, La Grande Bellezza. The performance is spanned to five boroughs. For more information, visit kittheater.com. Watch previous editions of Italics on cuny.tv slash show slash italics and web extras on our Italics YouTube channel, Italics TV. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Italics. Tune in to our next episode of Italics, airing June 25th. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.